This is the Shea Spark Show, where business and military leaders share what it means to invest in leadership, relationships, and self-love. And stay tuned for the end of the interview. There is a new coaching segment that you won't want to miss. What does self-love and peace have in common? Well, you're in for a treat today. Our guest is going to share self-love and peace and how being an ambassador of peace has really come from a place of her professional journey. Welcome to the Shea Spark Show. I am your host, Shea Sparks, where we talk with business and military leaders about what it means to invest in leadership, relationships, self-love, and most importantly, people. I am the Chief Excitement Officer of Sparks of Fire International, where we spark leaders to find, use, and share their voice through coaching podcasts and publications so that they're fired up about their life and business. And speaking of fired up, I know our guest today is fired up about what she has to bring to the table, and I cannot wait to get started. So welcome the amazing Edie Darling. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Shay. It is an honor, a mm. true honor to be here today. And I can't wait to just have this conversation with you, sis. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. And I just want to give a quick shout out to John Gronsky for introducing us and connecting us because yes. he's a huge friend of mine and a great fan of the show. And yes. as soon as I saw an email from him, I was like, oh, I know she's going to be amazing because you know, friend John's <laughs> a friend of mine. And it was like, oh, my gosh, we were separated at birth. As soon as Is that, that right? phone call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A sister from another mister. Yes, Yes. absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you for being here. And I can't wait to get dive in. But first, just so you know, for those of you who don't know, Edie Darling is a retired law enforcement sergeant and former senior chaplain in the Department of Detention and Corrections Bureau. She is an author, spiritual leader, motivational speaker, and true humanitarian. And most importantly, she is an ambassador of peace. Remember, we talked about peace, so I can't wait to learn more. She is the founder of Three is Enough, a 501c3 nonprofit, and she is a radio and podcast host of Wake Up, Edie Darling, that awakens you to the awareness and knowledge that we are not alone on this journey called life. She proactively bridged the gap between community and law enforcement relations by bringing the community, leaders, citizens, and law enforcement together at a roundtable of peace to address those issues that impact our communities negatively and have the propensity to impede the safety of all and hamper police relations. You can find out more on her Facebook page, Edie Darling, Ambassador of Peace, and we will have the link in the show notes as well to get connected with her. And Edie, ah, such a joy to have you here. And I always like to start off with the first question of what does self-love mean to you? You know, when I think of self-love, I think of truly Christ, Mm. first of all, right? His love for humanity and love of going after the lost, Mm. And so when we can recognize that we have been lost and when we come to know him, we're being found. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at that self-love of being able to identify those things in us that prevent us from truly loving ourselves and not looking at humanity or the other person to love us, but to first love ourselves, getting up in the morning, you look beautiful today, sis. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Or getting or getting up and saying, I am a good person or all of the things that you need to check off to confirm who you are, first of all, in him. And when you can love yourself, you are then able to love others. And that's Mm -hmm. the beautiful thing about self-love, taking care of yourself when others may not Mm. get it. Yeah. So I'll dissect that just for a brief moment. Please. You know, we look sometimes to other people to bring out something in us when really, in all honesty, we need to bring out that something in ourselves. So if it means that you, if something makes you feel good, positive, let me say it that way, those mm-hmm. positive things that make us feel good, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it is to take a 30 minute nap, to just 
decompress from today's hard labor of that what you've had to do, right? Because everything is coming at us like, <laughs> but mm -hmm. taking time out to decompress. If it means to sit down and just meditate for 15 minutes, just close your eyes and think about the positive things in life. Or if it means to go and get your feet done, you know, to get a pedicure, a manicure, but taking care of you first, because if you're empty, you can't help anybody else. Yeah. Well, I love everything that you said, but one of the things that you said is because Jesus loved us first, we can love ourselves. Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, as most of us, we look on the outside for that kind of validation that we are lovable from yes. someone else. Yeah. And how often in your own life have you, you know, maybe you're through childhood or coming up years that you were looking for validation, looking for that love for someone else. And it was like an aha moment. Finally, like, no, no, I need to validate myself first. Jesus already validates me. God already validates me. And I'm, I'm good in what they say. Yes. Yes. And you know, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, growing up, we're taught in a sense that we need to conform to mm. the other person's idea of what we should be. And if I may share this story yeah. real quick yeah. of when I was, what really sparked me to go into law enforcement, right? So my two brothers were in the military mm. and my one brother came home and they were outside fixing on my brother's car. And all of a sudden they came running inside the house and they had a sailor's mouth. Let me just say it that way. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't have the sailor's mouth <laughs> in mama's house. So I was thinking, oh my gosh, my brothers are getting ready to be killed by my mama. Right. Mm. So I'm praying for them. <laughs> so they ran inside the house and they said that they had been robbed by five guys with guns. Wow. And so my mother said that um, she needed to call the police. But let me tell you, law enforcement and the community weren't friends. You know, when I was growing up, my mother and my father always talked about how the police were not as nice to black and browns or people who mm. look like me. And then they talked about the water hoses and they talked about the lynchings of, mm. you know, and, you know, during their lifetime and, and how we couldn't really trust law enforcement at all because their whole objective was to take someone who looks like me and take them away from their families. And that's all the community ever knew. So we were mm -hmm. taught to run from the police. Well, on this particular night, my mom said, we're going to have to call the police. And for me, I was like, no. Yeah. So she says, no, we're going to have to call the police. So the police officer came out and he was a white male, young white male. He listened to my mother. He listened to my brothers. I didn't have anything to do but be a fly on the wall to listen to the conversation. But I watched how he treated my family with the utmost respect. Mm. I saw how he humanized my my brother's situation, that they didn't look down on them to think that it was something different than what they were reporting. And that right. was a crime had been uh, had taken place and they were a victim of a crime instead right. of trying to right. demonize my brothers for being in a situation that they found themselves sadly in. But right. that police officer didn't try to make any promises, empty promises. He says, listen, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we're going to be able to find these individuals because they did have masks on and so forth. He says, but we're going to do our best. Mm -hmm. And as he was getting ready to leave Shay, he shook everybody's hand mm -hmm. to include my hand. And when he shook my hand mm -hmm. at that moment, I felt like a torch had been passed on to me. I wanted to do what he had done. And that was changed lives because that man had changed lies. He had changed my life. And I knew that if he could do that for me, I could go out and do that for someone else. So when he got ready to leave I, and he shook my hand, I looked up at my mom and I said, mom, I know what I want to be when I grow up. And she mm. says, what's that baby? I said, I want to be a police officer. And she says, no, no, baby. You want to be a nurse. Wow. And so at that moment, I could have come into agreement with my mother. Mm. Right. And yeah. said, okay, mom, I'll be what you want me to be. Mm -hmm. But there was something that was on the inside of me being a, a young, impressionable individual. I knew at that moment, my destiny had been determined before I had ever known. It was, God said, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you hope. 
mm-hmm. for a future. And so at that moment, the hope of my future met me right in front of my face. And I said to my mama, no, no, mama, I want to be a police officer. And so mm-hmm. I went into law enforcement, had been in, been also left law enforcement, went to become the senior chaplain with some things in the community that I saw happening. I was like, I can't sit down on my gifts. I got to go back into law enforcement. So I put the chaplaincy down and went back into law enforcement. Wow. So, you know, being authentically you, yeah. loving you, being able to serve in your gifts, your talents and your abilities, you know what you're capable of. Why dumb yourself down for somebody else? Mm -hmm. Why try to be something for somebody that you were never intended to be, but your authentic self? And that's what I choose to walk in. And that's what I encourage others to walk in, Mm -hmm. their true identity that is finding God. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. That brings tears to my eyes because it's such such a touching story. But I'm just curious, how old were you when that happened? So- my brother was three years older than me. Actually, he was two years and 11 months. But, you know, he always said, I'm three years older. Right, right, right. <laughs> so I have to give it to him. Right. So he was in his first year. He graduated in 86. So this may have been in 87. Okay. So I'm 54 years old now. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So I was still in high school. Yeah. 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 So think about how, what a gift that that man gave to you, right? To be, to, like you said, passing the torch, you inherently knew that that was your destiny. And yet at that moment, like how beautiful. And you had the wherewithal about you to say to your mom, no, I'm not going to be a nurse, mom. I'm being called to this direction. I didn't get that until I was in my mid thirties. So yeah. how beautiful that you were able to really grasp onto that at, at that teenage age, right? Right. And you had people around you who were speaking life into you, were validating you, and yet your relationship that you had already at that age that you had with God was already validating you to go, no, no, here's this knowing you're right. going in this direction. Wow. And you know, what's interesting about something that you said there in the beginning, Shay, I will tell you, there wasn't the support Mm. uh, to go in law enforcement. Sure. Because you got to remember all the things, even though my mother Mm -hmm. made that decision that night to call the police, uh, we still, the community still wasn't friends. So therefore I was going against the grain of what, you know, we've been taught. The police are the enemy. Right. And now you want to go into the enemy's camp. You want to become one of them. You want to oppress our people. Mm. No, I don't want to oppress our people. I want to make a way for our people. I want to be able to educate our people. I want to be able to fight for Mm. our people. Right. Because there's a right and a wrong way of doing things. Yes. And so I wanted to go in and do things the right way and not and change the trajectory of the path of what people thought about law enforcement because law enforcement didn't have to be always skewed as being something bad, right? right? There's good. There's some good that law enforcement is doing. They're protecting and they're serving. And so that's what I wanted to go in and do is protect and serve all communities, Mm -hmm. regardless of race, regardless of color, regardless of our, our ethnic backgrounds, but to apply the laws and the rules of the land fairly and consistency, consistency across the board. Mm, Yes. Yeah. So you just mentioned support. So when you go through the police academy and go through the the training and and you're the decision-making and doing the actions, like you're in it to win it, right? Yes, yes. And did you have support from your family? And if you did not, Mm -hmm. like what was the conversation you had with yourself to support yourself that you are making the right choice? So two conversations happened. I initially tried to conform Mm. and go to school, taking the basic classes for my mother that led me to to make me want to go into nursing. Mm -hmm. And I was having a conversation with my older sister who happened to be five years older than me. She since passed on and she could tell that I wasn't happy. Mm. And she said to me, She said, Edie, what is it that you want to do? Mm. I said, I want to go into law enforcement. 
and she says, take a class, Mm. just take a class. So the first class that I took, you know, criminal justice class, right? I immediately, like, you know, like when all the sparks and the juices and everything, like your last name, right? All the fires are, (laughs) and my first professor, his name was Andy Dansky. And so I told him, I said, this is what I'm being called to do. And he says, then do it. And so my sister reiterated that. And she was like, you know what? Go do it. So I wound up going to school and getting my AA degree in criminal justice. And so my mother found out (laughs) on the day of or after graduation. (laughs) During during graduation. (laughs) I love it. So my sister prepped her though. Yeah. My sister said, Mama, on the program, (laughs) uh, you won't see Edie's name. In nursing, you're going to see her name down here. So, all right. So my mother was hot, to, yeah. say, the, to say the least. I got, I get home and I understand what her fear was. Mm. Her fear was that I was going to get out here and be killed. Sure. Her fear was that I was also, at the time, I was a single mother. Mm. When she thought that she was going to have to raise my children. So, but the second conversation I'm going to tell you about is what was pivotal. Mm. And life changing and life altering where I knew that I had her support and I still have her support today. Mm. So my mother came home from work one day and she was crying, boo-hoo-hoo, boo-hoo-hoo, crying. You know what I mean? Like snot, yeah. eyes, yeah. everything. And she says, I want to apologize to you. Me? Oh. Why do you want to apologize to me? She says, baby, I was sitting down at work. And she said, and I was talking to this fellow nurse and telling her how I was so mad at you that you wanted to go Mm. into law enforcement, how I wanted you to go into nursing. And she said that nurse kind of shook her into reality. She said, your daughter could be out there on drugs. Your daughter could be out there being a prostitute or falling into negativity, but you're mad at her because she wants to fight for Mm. what is right. How dare you? You ought to be embarrassed. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. And my mother came home and she was like, I support you. Whatever you want to do, I support you. When I was in the academy, I need, you know, you know, not everybody was sponsored. I wasn't sponsored at the time. So I was in what they call the open enrollment academy. Mm -hmm. And so I needed a gun. And my mom said, I'll buy you a gun. (laughs) (laughs) So I was like, oh, this is real. My mom's really supporting me. So she was the one who bought my gun for me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it was, it was powerful. So at that moment, and you're talking about, I went through the Academy in 1993, Mm. right? So we can kind of tell all the different things that were going on in the community in the early nineties yeah, in the eighties. yeah, And it didn't look good for people wanting Mm -hmm. to go in as it doesn't look good for people wanting to go in today. Right. Right. But when it's in you, it's in you. When you're called, you're called. Mm. Yeah. And so- yeah. Wow. Well, good. I'm so glad that she turned the corner and she changed did. her mind because there's something about support that, you know, we talk on here often about how it's so key to have someone to just say, Hey, I support you. I might not understand it. I don't get what you're doing, but yeah. I I'm going to support you anyway, because yes. when you don't have that and you're just like, I'm going through this alone, we have the tendency to give up on ourselves, right? And yeah. so at least with the support, there's people who speak life into you to yes. get you redirected back on the path of still trudging forward. So I'm so glad right. that you didn't give up. I'm glad that your right. sister spoke to you and and your mom yeah. is supporting you. That's beautiful. Absolutely. You know, what's interesting. My sister, I went into law enforcement. Again, I went into the academy in 93. I got hired in 94 mm-hmm. and my sister wound up passing away in 95. Oh, so it was, I feel it was like her ode to me mm. before she passed away to say to me, don't ever let anybody tell you what you're called to do, to shut it down. If you're called, walk it out. And I always think about her mm. and how just her encouragement at that moment allowed me to fulfill my journey and being in law enforcement, but it has taken some twists and some turns along the way that are just beautiful and why I can powerfully stand in the, in the position that I am today and really define that moment of what 
what does love and peace have in common mm. and to share that with you. And so, yeah. And then leaving law enforcement, I wind up becoming the senior chaplain in the jail and in the department of detention and correction, part of the agency that I was working for. Mm-hmm. And then in 2018, when it seemed like all hell was breaking loose in our nation, yeah. I said, I got to put down the cloth again, right? Put the cloth down and go back into law enforcement. Mm-hmm. So, and then that kind of morphed into the ambassadorship of peace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> curious. So here you are, a police officer and you're like, oh, I think I'm going to be a chaplain. Was that something that was always on your heart? Were you, was it like instilled in you? Like, did you have family members who were in the ministry and you're like, oh, I'm going to do this. Or was it something that you experienced while kind of on the beat where you're like, okay, I definitely have a ministry here. So, you know, Shay, I've, like I talked to you, I, I said to you, I've never really been a conformist, but I've always, God has always put me in positions that seem like to, I don't want to say, to break the mold, if Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Absolutely. So like law enforcement traditionally is a male role, right? Right. Ministry traditionally is a male role. Right. And so I've always seen, God has always seemed to put me in a position where you got to go in and break the mold. Yeah. Okay. So God called me into ministry actually in 1998 and I grew up Southern Baptist and women weren't recognized in Uh as, you know, as leaders in, in ministry. And so in 2004, I knew that God was calling me in ministry, but in, it was probably around 2003, 2004, because I was licensed in 2004, but I went to my pastor and I told him, I said, listen, I know this may sound strange, but God is calling me into ministry. And, you know, of course he sat down with me. I went through all of what I needed to go through to obtain my license. Right. And he went against the mold and licensed me to preach the gospel. And I will tell you that he caught some heat behind Mm, that. Yeah. But I can honestly give you, I can give him credit. It was before his time, Mm. right? Because he said, I am responsible to God and not to man. I have to hear what God is telling me to do and not listen to you. You, I am your, I'm the pastor of this church and you put me and I'm in this role for a reason. And so I was the first female to be licensed to preach the gospel within my denomination. Uh, Well, I'll say in my church, but we, of course, we had the Southern Baptists. I can only speak for my church. Right. And so it just opened the door for other women since that time Mm -hmm. to that were being called, that were sitting on the sideline, like that burning desire was to go and do the will of God, you know, not just being the Sunday school teacher, Mm -hmm. not just being the secretary that God had laid a word on their heart to go out and preach and teach the gospel message. Go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the father, the son, and the Holy spirit. And so they had that burning desire. And so it was just that door that needed to be opened. So the floodgates can open for the other women. Mm. So in 2010, I initially retired from law enforcement and went overseas. And then I came back in 2012, went back into law enforcement. But since something happened, I started getting ill. But I I knew that in 2009, I started feeling this pain in my gut. Mm. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it. But I kept telling the doctors, there was this pain, there was this pain. But they kept, you know how it is. Uh It's kind of like finding something else wrong, but not finding the true source of the the pain. Right. Right. So in 2000, I had gotten down soaking wet to 105 pounds. I couldn't wow. eat. I couldn't drink. And I wind up going out medically, right? Almost 14 months where I was on a feeding tube, having to learn how to eat again, having to learn how to walk again because I was so frail, right? Sure. I couldn't even, my hand was shaking just to try to hold a spoon. Wow. So I was ultimately diagnosed with a very rare digestive condition. It was called superior mesenteric artery syndrome. And so during that season of sitting down, right, 
I can, I'll, I'll never forget. God says, you might not be able to go put the gun belt back on, but you have a voice and my mm. people need to hear what is being said. So in 2014, that's when wake up with Edie Darling mm. came about, but I had prior to that, I was on, you know, teaching and preaching and all of those stuff. But, you know, while still being in law enforcement, wow. but while I was sitting down, getting my body back in order, self-care, yes, taking care of me, putting me first, mm-hmm. right? That's when I was doing the radio show, internet, it wound up being radio, they could get it on internet, you know, and so forth. And, and just sharing that message of faith, hope, and love and interviewing community leaders helping to bridge the gap between community and law enforcement relations, because we had a lot of mess going on in our nation sure. as we continue to have, mm-hmm. right? But that there are individuals on all facets and every facet that want to do right. Mm-hmm. Not everybody wa- is about themselves, mm-hmm. right? They're yeah. about the people. They want to hear the voice of the people and and being able to sit at a round table. And so that's how something that started off with a wake up with Edie Darling podcast interview, so forth, morphed into being an ambassador of peace. Mm. We never know how those little itty bitty pieces come together. It's the puzzle, yes. right? We're drawing the line and this, who knew that this would do this and this would do this. And here's the bigger picture. And you go, wow, but it's staying faithful, staying mm. true to the mission, to the mm. cause and not ever allowing someone else to stand in the way of what it is. And you're going to lose some friends along the way. I'm going to tell you that. Oh yeah. You're going to lose some family friends along the way because they don't understand. Yeah. They they don't understand the cause of the mission. And sometimes the the, the cause is greater, right. Than some relationships. Mm -hmm. And you, sometimes you just got to say, it's okay. I understand you weren't meant to go this, this route with me. You weren't, you you weren't meant to go this leg of the journey with me, but I thank you for the season that we were able to walk together. Mm-hmm. But I must go on. You know, the scripture tells us when Jesus was sending his disciples out two by two, right? He says, you'll know when you are being received, mm-hmm. right? He said, because they'll say, peace be unto you. Yeah. But you'll know when you're not being received. And he says, at that moment, wipe the dust from your feet and move on because somebody else is going to receive you. Mm. Keep going. Don't just stop just because someone tried to deter you and get you off track and try to talk about and defame your name and all these things. No, don't stop there because if you stop there, they're trying to stop the blessing. They're trying to stop the favor. They're trying to stop the cause. They're trying to stop the mission, but you got to stay focused. Mm. So focused that you don't get distracted. So, yeah. And so ultimately, and what was it? I I go back to the date because you know I'm all about dates, sis. <laughs> so it's all about almost about four, four or five years ago, I woke up and the Lord told me to seek presidential nomination to become an international ambassador at large, mm-hmm. ambassador of peace. You know, you got to be careful, right? <laughs> so I, I, listen, I got up, I was, oh, I got on Facebook. I was like, hey, y'all. <laughs> the Lord told me to seek presidential nomination to become an international ambassador at large, ambassador of peace. But first of all, it didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> okay. Ambassadors do, right? But ambassador yeah. of peace didn't exist, right? Wow. And then so I got community leaders to come behind me. They wrote letters to then sitting President Trump. Mm. And then when President Biden took office, they then wrote letters to President Biden. And I want to read this um, to you. The establishing the the ambassador of peace establishes round tables of peace Mm. and that they ensure that all people who are impacted by injustices, all people, not just one said people, but all people, people. because what happens to you should impact me. Mm. If there's an injustice, an injustice, it should impact you. And what impacts you should impact me. So, and those individuals who are on a quest of peace, I think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood for peace. He wanted to do peaceful protests. Yeah. We can still talk about those things that need to be talked about, but we don't need to riot. 
We don't need to do all of these things, but we can come together hand in hand, brother and sister of all races, all cultures, all backgrounds, right? Coming together in a peaceful manner. And that's what I do is bring those individuals to the table who are willing to have those conversations a peace. Mm. That's, yeah. Amen. And I love this because <laughs> you said so much in there. I was like, oh, I want to jump in with an amen. You yeah. have, well, first of all, you have such a gift because you can tell a story and then you can jump into a preaching and then come back to telling the story. And I so appreciate that. But just the the passion that you have around peace and what it stands for. And love. yet you're yeah. putting it in a way of of what Jesus wanted it to stand for, right? Because I love what you said. When an injustice happens to me, it also happens to you and vice yes. versa because yeah. we're all a collective one. We are. And, and yes. you know what? What's so beautiful, sis? What I tell people is if we could see each other, this is why I call you sis, <laughs> right? Because you are my sister. Mm -hmm. And when we have a family, what do we want to do? We want to protect, our, protect family. our family. exactly. But if we see each other as individual cells out there, then we disconnect from the collective thought of humanity, mm. right? But when we come together in a collective thought of humanity yeah. and see each other as family, then we're willing then to fight for family. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember? Oh, I, I can't say for you, but I'll tell you this, right? When I was a young girl, my daddy would always say, you got to protect your brothers and sisters, mm. right? Mm -hmm. If somebody's pushing on your sister or your brother, you and, and or they got into a fight, you better have came home with a scuffle too. Because uh, <laughs> if they got a bruise, you better have a bruise too, right? <laughs> or you got, if they got dirty, you better got dirty too. So basically I'm not condoning violence. But what I'm trying to say is, is that my dad was letting us know that as a family, you stand up for family mm. when there is a wrong. Because he also taught us, you will not start a fight. You won't go around hitting people. But if somebody is fighting you, you stand up for what is right. And you stand up for your brother and sister. And you don't allow them to get beat on. You don't allow them to be pushed down. You don't allow them to be torn to shreds in the community. But you mm. stand together as a united front. Mm. Yeah. So, and that's what I stand for is to be able to come together in a peaceful way to talk about the injustices, but not just talk about it, but to be doers and to see how we can collectively create change in our perspective communities, because every community is not the same. Mm. What one community needs, the other community, that might be a passe for them. Mm. They've already overcome that. But what if, what are we doing for the collective man of of the of humanity, yeah. right? In that said community. Yeah. So I'm grateful for the relationships. And what did yeah. you say? Together we are we stand united. Yeah. And yeah. that's what our isn't that not what we pledge? Exactly. I pledge allegiance exactly. to the flag mm -hmm. of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, if here's the key word, all. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. If we can recite it, then we better be doers of it. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Well, clearly we can talk for days, but before we continue, I just want to give a quick shout out to my sponsors for take a moment to do that. And I have partnered with some amazing people as the Heroes Media Group and that group over there who produces this show as well as partners on so many other projects. And also ULA Universe, they make this amazing energy supplement called Sisu Stamina. And if you want to know more about it, you can go to the website ulauniverse.com. And if you're interested in ordering, you can use the promo code SPARKS10 and it will save you 10% off at checkout. And also I want to mention the Firestarters book project I am a co-founder of, and it is about connecting and collaborating with other creative thought leaders inside a book to ignite a, a movement on a peace, hope, love, connection, collaboration, all the amazing things that we want to see because we are the change that we want to see in the world. 
So go over to the website of firestartersbookproject.com to learn more about that. Well, Edie, something that you are, you know, we've been talking about this whole time is, is peace. And, and even though you didn't say it, I kind of want to come back to it. So as a, a, a spiritual Christian woman myself, I really love that you're the ambassador of peace. And I want to go kind of the uh, spiritual side of peace. So when I pray Mm -hmm. and I say, God, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to do this or this? And one of the things I had to learn when my own journey is really find the peace that God gave me around the thing. Yes. Right. And that is how I know that that is the correct direction that he's guiding me to go. What is your take on when God gives you peace? So, you know, I think about, you know, we live in a chaotic world, Mm. right? And when we're working or whatever the case may be, we have a tendency of getting lost along the way, right? So I'll look at it from the storm. Remember mm-hmm. when the disciples were on, on the on the boat and Jesus mm-hmm. down at the bottom, he's sleeping, and mm-hmm. the disciples are up on the on I don't know all terminologies. I'll say deck, right? We'll yeah. say it that way. And they're seeing the storm raging around them. And one of the disciples runs down and he says to Jesus, "Do you not care that mm-hmm. we perish?" And Jesus replied back to them, "You know, O ye of little faith." Mm-hmm. And Jesus then speaks to the storm and he says, "Peace." be still. Mm -hmm. And so when we know that we are walking in the will of God, we can have that peace be still moment because he says, peace, I leave you. Right. He, he leaves us with peace. And he said, I'll give you peace that surpass all understanding, no matter what is going on around us, that we can get back center focus on the peace in the midst of the storm. And when you look at an eye of a storm, right. In the, in the midst of a hurricane, you see this big old eye. And then mm. that eye is calm, right? There's no activity in the eye. But if we can get in the center of the storm and say, peace, be mm. still, that no matter what is going on around us, that we can walk in peace and we can move in peace. So that's how I walk. Mm. And when I know that when God has given me something, and if I don't hear from him, if things, if, if, if there's a hiccup, right along the way or there's a roadblock along the way because i'll say to god god if this is your will for me to do this Mm. and make the crooked path straight Mm. let there not be any chaos around it but give me peace that this is what you want me to do and i always think about that i always think about the eye in the midst of the storm that do i have peace can i sleep am i wrestling with it if it's something that i'm wrestling with then it may not be from God at that moment, he may have given you the vision, but at the moment he hadn't given you necessarily all the ideas along the way to give you the Mm. full piece of it. And so when you can truly walk in and know that it is such great peace and you're doing what you're supposed to do, then you're on the right path and you can stand your ground Mm. and you can say, this is who I am. I don't need a title from the president of the United States. Mm. You get that right? I don't need a designation from the president of the United States. God designates me and he designated me as a peace ambassador. And I share that peace wherever I go. So how does this peace fall into the category of self-love? So when we think about the self-love is first identifying that you love yourself, right? And when you love yourself, you can then spread that love wherever you go, Mm. right? Because you want people to feel what you feel. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to believe what I believe, right? Because not everybody's going to, you know, believe what you believe. They're not going to necessarily stand for what you stand for. Right, Shay? Yeah. We already talked about, you know, when you're being received because they'll say peace be unto you. And mm-hmm. when they don't, you just wipe the dust from your feet and you move on. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's about now loving humanity. Mm-hmm. You got to love yourself first. And then you see yourself, through. you see humanity through the eyes of God. God mm-hmm. loves people. He desires that not one person perish. He wants to see everybody in the kingdom. You get that, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's our job, it's our responsibility to share love. Now, when I go out, and, and I thank you, Shay, for allowing me to be authentically Edie Darling. Absolutely. Right? 
And so when I go and I talk to communities, I, I say to them, if you want me to sit here and help you, you have to allow me to be authentically me. You have to allow me to connect with the God within me to be able to help you help your people. Mm. And to help the communities, because it's, that's the God that I know of that gives me the, the message in order to give the message to you. Because if I discount who I am, then I'm not being true to myself. Mm. Then it's a mute point. You get it, right? Mm. We're all just continuing to spin wheels. But you brought me in for a reason. And that is to help your, your community move further along than you were yesterday. Mm. Yeah. So when I started this podcast five years ago, that's what you're talking about is really the premise of how this all started. It comes from a place of overflow. It used to be called the power of investing in people and how we, when we invest in ourselves, then it overflows yes. onto our community, our life, yes. our family, our business. And I am a hundred percent like in the piece and knowing that what you're talking about, the self-love component yes. is from a place of overflow. Yes. And so is that piece. And then you continue to radiate and you use the word authenticity. And I just watched this, this study done the other day that they have now hooked up machines to find out frequencies of people that they're putting, like emanating, putting off. Yes. Yes. And they said, and I got the chills just talking about it. And they said, what is the frequency that that is the most highest putting off the furthest, the farther reach? And they said, is it peace? Is it love? Is it what is it? And they said, authenticity. Yeah. When we are in our authentic self, we and when we radiate yes. authenticity, yeah. it reaches further. And spreads farther and yes. overflows even yeah. more without Absolutely. us doing anything other than yeah. being authentic. Yes. So thank you and for being welcome. authentic and trusting that, you know, we've talked a lot about peace, but trust comes into that play as well. And I just appreciate that you are trusting yourself in, in being who you are. Yes. And so I wrote a book. It's called The Time Is Now. Awaken Your Dormant Gifts. Mm. And it also has a workbook. So one of the things that when I share this book with people, they'll say, well, what is the book about? And I'll say, the book is about you. And mm. they'll say, what do you mean? There's dormant gifts that are lying dormant inside of each of us, mm -hmm. right? There's a chapter in the book, it's called The Walking Dead. And mm. you see people walking around, they're upset, they're angry with life, whatever, because they are not walking in their true authentic self. Yes. You know, he says, you know, God says, I knew you before you were formed in the belly of your mother's womb, mm -hmm. right? Meaning he knew you. So if God knew you, then who you are throughout your life, if you deviate from that path of who you were meant to be, of course, you're going to be angry, right? Or let's say it this way, because I talk about this, you know, how my mother wanted me to be something she wanted to be all along. Mm -hmm. My mom wanted to be a nurse. So if she couldn't be a nurse, she wanted all of her daughters and to be a nurse as well. Right. So she could taste it. So what happens is for those that fall prey to that. Right. What do they do? They start putting their gifts, their talents, their true identities, their true selves on the shelf or mm -hmm. they bury it in the ground. And as a result, the true purpose of there's millionaires that are lying in the ground. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. There are creative ideas that are still lying dormant in the ground. Mm -hmm. And it's because someone didn't think you, how could God use you, an ordinary person to do something so extraordinary? So sometimes people will put their thumb on you and mm -hmm. make you out to be, cause they're jealous. Yeah, They wish it was something that they would do. And so instead you know, not to say that that's what my mother was trying to do. No, my mom was coming from an authentic place, right? right. She knew that that was a, a good job and it was something that was going to change lives and help people. Still doing what I was doing. I just carried a gun. <laughs> <laughs> We're still first responders, yeah, right? There you go. But some people just do it from a different perspective. Yeah. So along the way, so this is what I did. And the Lord laid that book in my belly. 
So mm. when people read it, it's bringing out the gifts, the talents and all those things and what got you away from it. And they write down in the workbook, all the, the naysayers who mm. said, oh, you can't do that. But no, you can. Mm -hmm. And it's not too late. As long as you have breath in your body, there's something lying dormant in you that's waiting to burst out of the seams to come to light. That mm. might be that next idea that's so life changing for somebody or that next president of the United States that's waiting to come. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's anything. It's, it's endless. The yeah. possibilities that's lying dormant in people. Yeah. Love it. So you said it, you birthed it out of your belly. So I'm just curious, were you sick first and the book came after or were the book first and then the, and then the sick? <laughs> right. So the book was written originally to believe it or not, the first rendition of the book was written in 2004. Mm. It was when I was in ministry and people were like, oh, this is too deep. <laughs> <laughs> It's before it's time, right? you know, because it kind of brought people, they they couldn't see it because we were so used to doing conforming, right? Yeah, yeah. But now, so then the book was rewritten, you know, kind of had a new look in 2019, mm. right? And it was on demand at that time. They're like, you need to write that book. You need to put that book back out. And I was like, okay. So I kind of did a little bit different and I left some things out. And they're like, why'd you leave that out? I was like, well, when it was in there, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> since you can't please everybody no you, get you cannot you, you just cannot. do what you're called to do and when, and so, when were you sick what year were you sick so I was on my deathbed sis yeah. in 2000 and coming into 2012 2013 is when I was finally diagnosed with the right the doctor came and diagnosed me and out oh I gotta give a shout out to my doctor Dr. John Paul Gonzalo because I'll never forget as I'm laying there on my sick bed and I said to my doctor, I said, doc, I said, are you a believer in the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ? And he says, I am. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to answer me. You right. get that, right? Yep. He said, I said, he said, yes, I am. I said, okay. I said, I believe that God is getting ready to give you his eyes. And I believe that God is getting ready to give you his hands to heal me. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm a cold case situation. As a detective, formal, you know, mm -hmm. working in law enforcement, I said, there are cold case files. The pieces of the puzzles are there, but the detective may have missed something along the way and the case goes cold. But then there's a new detective that comes who has a fresh set of eyes. Mm -hmm. So I told my doctor, I said, doc, you're that fresh set of eyes that is going to be used mm. to put this case to rest because mm. I know that I God gave me a vision and this right here is not in it. This story of me being on my deathbed is not in it. There's more to me to be told. And so he says, I believe. I said, okay, I believe too. So it was Thanksgiving Day, mm -hmm. 2013, that I went into surgery. And, you know, I'm only 105 pounds soaking wet. So, you know, I was really frail, right? Mm -hmm. I'll send you some pictures later, Shay. And I woke up. He was tapping me on my leg. Edie, Edie. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he says, we found it. Mm. I said, you found it, Doc? He said, we found it. He said, Edie, I don't know how you're here. He said, because you've been complaining about this since 2009. Wow. I said, yes. He said, this is 2013. He said, finding situations like this, it would be in the morgue. Wow. He said, but he said, but we found it. And he said, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. And I said, okay. He said, now you got a feeding tube. I got a feeding tube. I'm looking down. Ooh, what's this? <laughs> and it was in the center, you know, in my diaphragm area. He said, yeah. He said, otherwise I would have had to reroute your whole entire intestinal tract. Wow. He said, but I put the feeding tube in that little area to keep it as a buffer. So that way your artery wouldn't be compressed. And so it allows the fat you know, some muscle to some, some meat to get back on your bones, so to yeah. speak. And, and, and that's what happened. And then I had another incident in 2016 wow. on Easter Sunday. Mm. And, but I knew then that I shall live and not die mm -hmm. because God's got a greater work that he wants us to do out here. And if it means that sometimes you got to go through some things mm. in order to really 
give someone else hope. So I'll go through it anytime. If it means that somebody got a little bit of hope from it. Yeah. Well, I am full of blessings to know you and to call mm -hmm. you sis. So thank you. Yes. Thank you for sharing your stories and, and just being authentically you and just gracing us with your presence has just been beautiful. So what yeah. do you want to be remembered for? What would be your legacy? You just mentioned hope and you're already the ambassador of peace or so those weaved in. It is. It's all interwoven. Ooh, it goes back to something I used to tell my children that if, if ever I was killed in the line of duty, right? Because you have to mm -hmm. prepare your family oh, yeah. for that, for that possibility but that they can know that I died doing what God called me to do. Mm. So if I'm ever remembered for anything that I am remembered for doing the will of God and coming from an authentic place of love for humanity to want to see humanity be in a better place than we left it before. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I'll go back to him. He had a dream, right? And he said, I may not get there with you, but I stood on the mountaintop and I could see over, he wasn't able to get there with us, but he got us to the next stage of where we were before, where we were before, right? Yeah. But it's each of our responsibility to take the torch a little bit further. And all I want to do is do my part. Mm. And everybody should want to be able to just do their part to yeah. make humanity better. So that's what I want to be remembered for. Mm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, you are living that right now. So yes. thank you. Thank you for that. And we mentioned your Facebook page. So can you repeat that on where people can connect with you or other social media? Yes. So it's Edie, E-D-I-E, -E, Darling, D-A-R-L-I-N-G, Ambassador of Peace. That's on Facebook. They can also, you know, go on Amazon and they can purchase the book. You know, the time is now, Awaken Your Dormant Gifts, and they'll see the workbook that goes along with it. And they can also find me at ediedarling.com. But I do encourage everybody to find me on Facebook because under Edie Darling Ambassador of Peace, because you'll be seeing what I'm doing out in the community. And if your community is hurting and you've been hitting that glass ceiling and you can't seem to go to the next step and you want to learn how to and you would like me to come alongside you. I, I, may I say this, sis? I don't go in and take mm -hmm. over someone's community. I want to make that very yes. clear. Do you already have, they have leaders who have been waiting for the opportunity. What I ask the uh, communities to do is find that, whether it's a government entity, but find that community leader who has the voice of the people and let us come to the table. And so I help them find those peaceful practices and tools to help them take it further in their community. And then I go on to the next community. I love that. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So thank Beautiful. you, sis. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, literally thank you for being here and, and being authentic and, and brave to share all of your, your glory and your story with us. Mm. 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 It's an honor. It truly is. Um, I'm so grateful for John for mm -hmm. introducing us, even though yeah. I'm not military. I do come from a military family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not military either, but I do have a military uh, a dad as well. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I support the military 100%. Yes. So thank you for what you do to help bring those leaders together at your table so we mm -hmm. can hear those stories of what we are collectively doing in all facets. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before you go, I like to leave with this question of what phrase scripture or mantra are you living by right now? Mm. Oh my gosh. Let no man, woman, or child stand in the way of the things of God. Mm -hmm. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. Just one quick moment. Remember how I told you, you're going to lose some friends along the way. Mm hmm you might lose a spouse. You might lose your best friend of many, 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 many years. But what is it that God, you know, called you to do? And it goes back to that young man who was with Jesus. And he told Jesus, he says, I want to follow you. 
He said, but before I do, he says, let me go back and bury my dad. Mm. Jesus said to him, listen, let the dead bury the dead. What we got to do is for, we got to go to the living. And so you can't let people stand in the way of the things. Everybody's not going to see what you see, mm. but you go with those who do. Yeah. And you move in that momentum and you be the life change. You be the change that you want to see. Yes. So yes. that's it. I love that. Thank you. Thank you You're for welcome, being here. Sis. Stay tuned for our next segment because you won't want to miss it. Welcome to the Don't Be a Dick segment. And Dick stands for Dishonorable, Inconsiderate, Conniving, and Know-It-All. In today's episode, we talked with Edie and she shared with us so many amazing, beautiful things about being an ambassador of peace about what it means for self-love, and not to mention being your authentic self and how that all weaves together. But the thing I love the most is that she had written a book, and we didn't even really touch on that, but it kind of weaves everything together. And her book is The Time Is Now, Awaken Your Dormant Gifts. So what is it, your gifts, what gifts are you hiding from yourself? Oftentimes, we want to not believe that we are good at something. You know, just recently, I had a conversation with somebody and I could see in them, oh my gosh, you would be such a, you're such a leader. And they're like, a leader? I am not a leader. Like, I don't want to lead. I don't want to be in charge. I don't want to be any of that. And I said, okay, but naturally, you're already a leader. So even though you want to shy away from it, your, your presence on this earth is you're a leader. So it takes me back to, you know, how are we being dishonorable to ourselves? How are we being inconsiderate to those, those dormant gifts that we have that we're not paying attention to? Is there things that people have said to us, compliments that people have given us that we hold up a shield like Captain America was like, no, no, I don't want to believe it. I don't want to believe that I may actually be a, have something good to offer this world. And that comes from a place of, you know, be, believing the lies that we've been told in our childhood that maybe we're insignificant or that we're incompetent or, or maybe we're unlovable. And so I just want you to sit with today. What is it that you're not believing when someone tells you those things? You know, maybe somebody's giving you a compliment and you push it away. You know, what what is laying dormant inside you? What gift is laying inside of you that is just waiting to burst through and shine that you are not paying attention to, that you're pushing away? a compliment because you yourself have been dishonorable, inconsiderate, and you're conniving yourself that you just don't believe it. So I would love to hear from you. If you go to the shaysparksshow.com, there is a place to leave an email or a voice message. I would love to hear from you. How are you not living in your full authentic self And what are you going to do about it? How are you going to shift that for you? What's going to make you more authentic? I want to know. And if you have a block or you've come up with a belief that you're not whatever enough of some sort and you need some help in breaking through that belief, then let me know that too. I am a certified fearless living coach, master practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming, mental and emotional release, and hypnosis. And I have helped dozens, I don't like to say dozens, actually hundreds of people to break through their own belief system, their own crazy thoughts of the the gifts that they've been ignoring. And I see something in them that other people have seen in them, but they are pushing it away instead. So be willing to let down that armor let down that guard and allow the good stuff to come in because you deserve the good stuff too. Well, that is all the time we have for today. Cannot wait 
until we meet again next time. And so until next time, let's get fired up.